Lean Leadership Podcast, Episode 11. Action is the greatest thing you will ever do if you want to become good at lean. This is the Lean Leadership Podcast. Equip yourself with the tools for success in your team's lean journey by learning from the world's top lean professionals. Listen at the risk of improving with your host, Chris Burnham. Hello, Lean Leadership Nation, Chris Burnham, and I am fired up to be with you today on the Lean Leadership Podcast. Before we introduce today's guest, I want to make you aware of a new way for you to engage with the show, and it's called SpeakPipe. SpeakPipe is a plug-in that we've placed on the website, which is leanleadershippodcast.com, and it allows you to leave a 90-second message about anything you want to leave it about. And that's a way that you can leave us a comment about the show. If you have a question for one of our guests, we'd like to hear it, and hopefully we can try and engage you with the guest and and maybe we'll use it on a future show. So again, that's SpeakPipe. It's on the website at leanleadershippodcast.com, and we'd love to hear from you. Today's guest is I'm really excited about. It's Paul Akers. Paul is founder and president of FastCap LLC based in Bellingham, Washington. FastCap is an international product development company founded in 1997 with over 2,000 distributors worldwide. A prolific inventor, Paul holds U.S. and international patents. His company, FastCap, launches approximately 20 new innovative products per year and is one Business of the Year in 1999 and 2010. Paul and his wife, Leanne, have built FastCap from their garage into a multi-million dollar company in 13 years. He catapulted into the business world when his knack for problem solving led to an invention and eventually his own manufacturing business started in his garage. Through a series of twists and turns, he discovered Lean and the Toyota production system, which helped launch his business from the garage into the successful international product development company it is today. Using Lean, Paul's company has prospered and expanded even in the current economic downturn. He has never laid off one employee nor cut one salary and currently offers the highest entry level pay for any business in the region where his company is located. Paul is also the author of his own book, Two Second Lean. I have a feeling, folks, you're going to enjoy this episode because he has a passion and a zeal for continuous improvement. So without further ado, I introduce to you, Paul Akers. Paul, welcome to the podcast. All right. Well, Chris, I'm happy to be here. All right. Well, we briefly touched on who you were in the intro, but can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, what you do, and how Lean, Six Sigma, or Continuous Improvement is a part of your life? Well, you know, I've always been a little bit of a frustrated person because early on, I always struggled in school. I was dyslexic and I wasn't a good student and, you know, maybe just a little bit of a frustrated person, never could find the groove, if you will. And, but I was always relatively successful because I was pretty disciplined because my, the way that I overcame my disabilities, if you will, if you can call them those, they really were not. But, uh, I just was really disciplined in everything I did. I just focused on achieving and, and overcoming those those problems. But then when I came across Lean about 14 years ago in 2000 approximately, you know, everything just changed for me because I was always trying to figure everything out. I was always trying to make everything work. I was always trying to figure out how to make everything better and everything got better, but it didn't really get a lot better because there really wasn't a, a, a well-organized system. And so when I came across Lean, I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is crazy. This is what I've been looking for. And then when the results of Lean became a reality in my life, when we did some Kaizen events, if you will, at my company, and I saw the, the huge impact, it wasn't, you know, again, like a, a 10 or 20% increase. It was like a 500 and 800% increase in productivity. They were, they were just so huge. It was just like undeniable, Paul, you're a fool and you don't know what you're doing. And that's when really everything changed for me. So, you know, my background is I'm a carpenter. I'm just a regular guy and I have a degree in education. I was an industrial arts teacher and, you know, I just learned about lean and everything went crazy crazy. And at that time, fortunately, I just started my company, FastCap, which is a product development company for innovative products for woodworkers, because that's what I am. Basically a shop floor guy coming up with a solution to something. And my FastCap was the first product, a peel and stick cover cap. And that's really how I got going in, in business in terms of that. And then also with Lean. Well, Paul, I know I'm going to enjoy this podcast because my father is a retired surgeon and he's the only surgeon I know that never played golf. He had a wood shop and in in his shop, he's got some third and fourth generation tools in there. And my dad was the only doctor I know that made really expensive sawdust. That was his release. And he has created some beautiful pieces of wood Mm -hmm. that uh, just testimonial. I mean, just beautiful. I know. I'm right there. I've made all the furniture in my house. I've built my home. It's a green and green home. I've got Gustav 
rustically furniture everywhere. I built all the guitars in my house. I'm a maniac when it comes to woodwork. I think there's something magical about taking a piece of wood and turning it into something so beautiful. I, I remember so many pieces. I just sat back and I said, I made that. And that, that was just so awesome. I only wish I knew about lean back then. You yeah, know? no kidding, that right? Been, that, that, <laughs> that would even been better. So, well, good deal. Well, before we get started in the interview, we always like to start off with a quote or a mantra from a favorite lean leader. So can you share with us a quote that you like and why you chose that quote? Well, recently I was with Shigeo Shingo's son, uh, Richio Shingo in Japan. And I asked him, Mr. Shingo, if I met you and we were in a park bench and you were watching your grandchildren feed the ducks and I didn't know who you were and we were just having chit chat sitting there on the bench and I said to you, what is it that you do? And he said, well, I'm the president of Toyota China and I started Toyota in, in the UK and I opened up the Georgetown plant in the United States. And I say, I'm really kind of like a lean expert in the Toyota production system. And you told me that. I said, what is the Toyota production system? What would you tell somebody like me who knows nothing about anything? And the words he spoke to me were so profound. And when you hear him, you'll know why. He said, all the Toyota production system is, is the accumulation with his Japanese accent of a whole bunch of small ideas from everyone. That's awesome. And, and I just said, oh, I said, what? that is it. It's so simple and people make it so complicated. The accumulation of a bunch of small ideas from everyone. There you go. That's awesome. <laughs> That's powerful. So It is powerful. One of my goals with this podcast is to help other lean leaders and lean thinkers resonate with your experiences. So you've had some success with your own company with lean, and now you're kind of a mentor to other people to, mm -hmm. you know, basically teaching them the things that you've learned from your experiences. So to help other people kind of resonate with, hey, this could work for me too. Can you tell us about how or why you chose the profession you did to mentor others with lean? So in terms of what you're asking, me is why I chose to be a mentor for lean to other people. Yes. That's what you're asking me. That's an interesting question because I never have had that question asked to me before, except for yesterday, somebody asked me, I just spoke at the Continuous Improvement Conference for Printing Industry in Milwaukee. And John Compton, who I interviewed, who knew Dr. Deming, came up and asked me, why are you doing this, Paul? And I said, God, that's a great question. And here was my answer. I struggled so much as a young man learning and just dealing with stuff, right? And then when I finally, somebody helped me to understand at a higher level, and I finally felt what it felt like to be successful, it was the most amazing feeling I'd ever had in my entire life. And I thought if I could let other people feel what that feels like, they could do anything. And so all I'm really trying to do is help other people feel the success that I've had in life. And the way that I got there is by learning the power of continuous improvement. So I'm just simply wanting wanting to let other people experience what I, what I, the joy that I've learned in my life. That's awesome. What I love about that is you struggled as a student. And when something finally resonated with you at that point, you realize I can help someone else with the same thing. And I, I, I you talk about respect for the people. You said it made me feel good and I wanted to help other people feel good. And that just mm -hmm. uh, talks to your teacher spirit that you have. That's great. That's it. I know that you've had a, a successful run in the past 14 years with your lean journey with your company, and you've had some incredible experiences. But I'm sure that like many folks, that have gone down the lean road, there have been times where you've had struggles and setbacks and pitfalls, uh, maybe you left scratching your head. Is there a, a story that you can share about your biggest setback with lean or continuous improvement and any pitfalls or mistakes that you went through that you want to share with our listeners? No, you want to talk about the one that happened today? <laughs> Recent is good because it's fresh in the memory, right? Yeah. Well, you see, Continuous improvement is not a place that you arrive at. It's it's a journey. And I always say, you know, people walk into my company and they engage my people and they say, you know, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never seen people this happy. I've never seen people this engaged. I can't even believe the level of improvement. I, I just see thousands of improvements everywhere that's gone on. Everybody's doing it. Everybody gets it. Everybody's fully engaged. And, and you know what? That's true compared to most companies. 
right? And most organizations, it is magic. I'm going to be honest with you. It is magic. But if you peel back the layer and look behind, there are still frustrations. There are still people that make some colossal mistakes, me being the number one person, right? And it's just part of what lean is. It can be a little ugly sometimes. It can be a little difficult. But I always have to say, to quote Thomas Sowell, compared to what? I mean, compared to everything else, this is Disneyland, right? So put on a happy face and get over it. That, that's, that's the way I deal with it. And so, you know, we had a situation today. You want a specific story? I'll give you a specific story. We got an order for 150 products, right? My One of my top lean leaders, instead of shipping, and we do everything two hours, fax to truck. And so we got a powwow. We said, hey, we got this order. Can we do this? And we said, yeah, we can do it. And then it turns out they went to, they went to look on the shelves and there was 140 of them or whatever it was that were ready to go. And they said, well, we got to run another 13 of them. So we went down to our injection molding machine and our department, unfortunately, both our people were sick today. So we've got two novice operators of Sumitomo's, you know, quarter of a million dollar machines, you know, trying to make these machines work and try to get 14 parts out so we can finish this order. That's how concerned we are for customers. We've got to wait until the guys come in, but it's all about the customer. So they're down there and they spend half a day punching buttons and everything. And I walk down there, I go, how's it going? It goes, not very good. We're having problems. We're getting short shots. We're having all this stuff. And these are really really smart people. One happened to be my son and the other one was one of my top lean leaders. And, you know, at four hours into it, two people, you can imagine how much money this is costing. It's crazy. And to get 14 parts out and the parts are like four bucks a piece. So, but we don't care because it's all about the customer, right? So it turns out we go through the whole day and then about two o'clock in the afternoon, I find out we actually have those 14 parts, but they're on the shelf. They're already pre-packaged. And I'm looking at them going, why in the hell didn't you just unpackage them and put them in the order, fill the order and wait till the operators came in the next day and ran the machine efficiently, right? And they just said, uh, we didn't think of that. There's the honest answer, Chris. So we could be as good as we are and we still screw up colossally, right? And I do the same thing. This is not directed at them. I make the same level of stupid mistakes every day myself. That's the reality. We're not perfect. And get over it because you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Fast cap's not perfect. None of us are perfect. And when that stuff happens, you just put your head down. You keep plowing ahead. You don't give up. What I take out of that story is, is that even for someone as successful with Lean as FastCap is and with your company and where you've driven the knowledge and the experiences of the power of continuous improvement down to the people that do the create the value every day and you still make mistakes. I love the humility of it is, is that you said, hey, I make mistakes too. And I'm sure that thinking the way that you think and seeing how excited you are and being a profit for lean, somebody that wants to talk about it, you said, hey, we've got a Kaizen opportunity here, right? I mean, we've got yeah. some ways to improve the process so that the next time that this we're faced with this, we can make a different decision. Absolutely. And the, the, here was the takeaway. And this is what we've learned. One of the things I've learned recently, oh gosh, I went to Auto Leave in Utah. They're an amazing company that's been doing lean for a long time. And, and I asked them a question because I always try to distill everything down to something very simple. I said, what's the number one thing Toyota taught you after spending five years in your organization, five years Toyota spent training Auto Leave on lean at no charge. They put their top lean people there and they taught them. And I said to the, to the girl who was giving me the tour, I spent an entire day there. I said, so what was the number one thing you walked away from after five years of working with Toyota. And she said something again that is so profound. It's like, it's resonating in my head. I can't get it out of my head. She said, Toyota taught us how to be teachers. They taught us how to get on the shop floor and become teachers and teach other people how to teach. And I go, isn't that what lean's all about? So what we take away from that example that I gave today where we colossally screwed up was that was an opportunity for me to teach and work with my lead people and say, hey, look, at, so here's what we want to do. We want to consider the cost of what it costs to, to figure out how to go through the entire learning curve of running a quarter of a million dollar injection molding machine that we don't have a lot of experience in, right? And then we want to consider the cost of the order. We want to kind of step back the big picture and say, hey, is it a big deal if we unpackage 14 things and have to repackage them tomorrow, do a little bit of overprocessing? Or do we want to go through that deep dive learning curve and, and kind of do all that? So we just kind of always got to take that big picture view and then start working from there and not just go, hey, we got to get the order out. Let's figure out how to run this machine. Do you follow what I'm saying? I absolutely follow. <laughs> so, 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 so we just always want to take that opportunity to learn. And, and, you know, Lucas came up to me and said, I hope you're not mad at me. I said, man, are you kidding? I'm not mad at you at all. This is just an opportunity for us to learn and get better because tomorrow is going to be better than today because we have a little more knowledge as, or as, as Dr. Deming 
I've just learned from Dr. Dan, we have, we're, we're, we're learning to have profound knowledge. We're learning to have real truth and real understanding. And that's what we really want. So the next day is better than today. And I think what I love about that story is that you talk about stepping back and taking a look at the entire value stream or the entire business unit as a whole. And oftentimes <laughs> we tend to micro focus into or zoom in specifically mm-hmm. where the challenge is. And, right. we, and we will create these optimization islands where, you know, one area... <laughs> <laughs> One area is, is is great at the expense of everybody else. And so yeah, yeah, it yeah. takes that leader to have the courage and the, the leadership courage and self-awareness to step back and say, let's look at everything here. Let's look yeah. at how everything works together. We want to be big picture thinkers. We want to be long-term thinkers. Nothing's for the immediate, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and we just want every opportunity to teach that. And, you know, I could give you four other examples that happened today that were similar where we just spent a lot of time working with people, sorting things through things. And I mean, when I say a lot of time, I don't mean like 10 minutes. I mean like an hour, an hour and a half. We had issues, we had problems, we had mistakes. And we just zoomed back and we got the people together and we said, now let's take a look at what happened. Why did it happen? Where did we fail? Where were the, where were the, where were the disconnects? And we owned up to them. We took responsibility. One of them was mine. And I just said, Hey, that was totally me. I screwed that up. It's just, that's what you do. Well, I think another thing about that is that because you guys have been so focused on eliminating waste from your processes, mm-hmm. you now have that time to focus on looking for more waste and and, yeah. it, and it doesn't <laughs> suboptimize the company, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great journey. You gave us your setback with Lean and that was today and you still somehow managed to turn it into a success story. But mm-hmm. is there a particular success story or maybe an aha moment with Lean or your continuous improvement journey, like one that stands out from all the others that you'd want to share with our listeners? Well, there's so many. I mean, I could reach back in history and tell you when we first, you know, saw how inefficient we were that, you know, when we had the Japanese consultants come in, they, they turned our place around and made 500% improvements and added tens of thousands of dollars to the bottom line in the first month. I mean, it was just so dramatic what happened. But of course, the, let's back up a little bit. You don't ever do lean for money. It's not about money. The minute you make it for an extrinsic motivation, you have screwed up this whole philosophy. It is about intrinsically wanting to improve the quality of the life of the people that you're responsible for and your customers. That is why you do lean. You want to add quality to everyone's life and the money is a byproduct. And I'll tell you one story that is one of my favorites, again, that resonates with me. It happened a couple of years ago. So one of, we have so many people around the world that are doing lean in the way that we kind of do lean, the simple lean of seeing waste, continuously improving, small improvements every day, making before and after videos, meeting every day in a daily huddle. These are our, this is our kata, this is our routine. We do three essing every day, we make a small improvement and then we we meet as a team. Ashley Bailey comes to mind. He's just a fabulous guy in the UK, manufacturing company, uh, uh, stairs or commercial industrial stairs. And he said something that was so insightful that I've never forgot because he grabbed it and grabbed it more than I did and more than any other lean leader I've ever seen. He said, okay, guys, he brought his team together. He said, I want you to make improvements to our factory, but I don't care. And I don't want any of them to be, have anything to do with making me more money or saving the money, the company money. I just want it to be for you. So the quality of your life improves and your work environment improves. And I think for him to, to say that to his employees so succinctly and so clearly, I've never heard a leader ever say it. It is not for me. It is not for my bottom line. It's not for my wallet. It is for you. That, that is just like, wow. How does someone get it at that level? I drove from Birmingham, Alabama, or actually Atlanta, Georgia to Memphis yesterday. And Mm -hmm. I listened to Ron Pereira's podcast with Ashley on there. And I heard Mm -hmm. that story, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I'm like, he gets it. I want to get it. I want to get it like that. Right. You know, I I, I talked to Ashley all day long. You know, we boxer back and forth. He's a very close friend of mine, along with Greg Glebe and Michael Altop in Germany and Nick Cosell down at Walters and Wolf. These are all we call us the Lean Rat Pack. There are five of us that really are just helping one another and trying to spread it to as many people around the world as we can. And the hair goes up in the back of my neck too. How in the world was I gifted with this level of friendship from these people? It is, 
it's incomprehensible. That's a pretty powerful mastermind group there. I mean, that, that if you're a lean student, to be a fly on the wall in that room and just hear the discussions would be awesome. You guys should probably record one of those sometime and, and share <laughs> it with the world, right? Well, we actually do. It's called the Lean Roundtable. I think we recorded three or four of them now, and we're about ready to record another one. And it's just a great time of us sharing ourselves. Or as Dave Hagen from Bolt Construction says, it's open kimono, man. We're, 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 we're just totally being who we are. There's no like, oh, we got our act together. We're all just laughing at each other. We're all so screwed up. It's unbelievable. But, you know, we're having fun. Awesome. Well, the next segment of the podcast here, Paul, is what we consider the hot seat segment. And these are questions that may not necessarily require a story behind them. It's just kind of shoot from the hip. Tell us the first thing that comes to your mind. And let's just roll through these and see how it goes. Are you ready? Okay. I'm all All ready. So the first question I have is, do you have a lean or continuous improvement pet peeve or something you frequently see being applied or being done wrong? Well, the number one thing is, you know, I speak at conferences all the time and and everyone always comes up and says, I just can't get this department to do it. And I'm looking at them going, it has nothing to do with that department. It has to do with you. You become lean. You become an expert. You become a magnet for excellence and everything will change. But as long as you think everybody else has to do it. That's why, that's why you're failing in every company, period, that has been wildly successful. The top person has internalized this and said, it is my processes. It is the way I answer my email. It is the way I lead my focus groups. It's the way I lead my, my meetings. It's all me. I need to be improving. And the more they set that example of them improving, everything goes right. But people, for whatever reason, always want to say, oh, it's this department. My boss doesn't get it. It's you. You're the problem. Yeah, I was uh, in my very first podcast interview. I was on Skype with Mark Graben, and I asked him what piece of advice he would give to the journeyman professional. And he loved it. He uh, adopted it from Stephen Perry in the UK. And he said, resistance to change is directly proportionate to your lack of leadership. And he loved that because it was something that could fit in a tweet. I mean, it was it, and it was so true. It was like one of those yeah. truisms that you come across. I, I always tell people, I say, think about FastCap, who FastCap is. We have 50 employees. We're a 50,000 square foot facility. We're really just a small little company. We're a nothing organization in the scheme of things, right? How does a company that small have an impact where we have the biggest companies in the world? This is the third time Amazon has been here. Toyota has been here. Bombardier has been here. We have the biggest, most powerful companies, banks, institutions, you name it, come to learn from us. How come? The only reason why is because we got really good at lean. And that seems to be an attraction to people. Not because we're telling people how to do lean. We are good at lean. If you want to attract people, set yourself on fire with whatever you're you can, passionate that's about. That's right, right. And then again, compared to what? The, the truth of the matter is compared to most organizations, yeah, we are good at lean. Compared to Toyota, we're a total joke. We are an absolute abomination to the word. Toyota is a 99 on a scale of 1 to 100. We are a 3. We are an absolute total joke. From A to Z, soup to nuts, it is a joke what we are doing compared to Toyota. Awesome. What do you consider the most important thing that you've learned in your career journey as it relates to lean so far? Wow. The most important thing. Wow. There's so many. Okay. This is going to be a little different answer than maybe most people will give you. Discipline. The reason why I do lean is because I saw operational excellence when I went to Lexus and Toyota. I saw an organization operating at a level so far above anything I even thought was possible, let alone what I'd seen, right? So when I embarked on the lean journey, there were so many pitfalls. There were so many reasons to give up. But I always had that vision and that desire to be and look like Toyota. That it was the sheer discipline to never give up that has got me where I am today. And I think that most people don't possess a high level of discipline. Now I'm really going to shock you what I'm going to tell you next. I think discipline is not discipline. I think discipline, and this may sound self-serving, so please don't misunderstand me, but it's just an epiphany that I've had. I think discipline is a reflection of intelligence. I think people who are highly disciplined have analyzed the big picture and thought about really what's at stake. And the discipline is a byproduct of being incredibly thoughtful about the big picture. That's powerful. One could even say that discipline is a reflection of 
personal kata where you've reflected on the mistakes that you've made and you've kind of sorted out the things that don't add value to your personal standard work and you've eliminated those and you only focus on the ones that you know create value for yourself and for others. So I, I that that makes sense. That is discipline. So that's the way I kind of look at it right now. I just try to have, going back to Dr. Demi, I try to have profound knowledge, profound understanding. The more understanding I have, uh, magically, the more discipline I have. Paul, I'm hopeful that there's somebody out there right now that's either taking a walk or they're driving to work and they're listening to this podcast and they're looking for a nugget of knowledge that can act as that flint or that spark to Mm -hmm. ignite that level of passion in them for continuous improvement. So what piece of advice would you give to someone that's just starting out in Lean or Six Sigma or continuous improvement? Do it immediately, right now. The very second you're hearing this word, find something that bugs you and fix it immediately. Do not put it on a list. Do not contemplate it. Do not think about it. Do it. Action is the greatest thing you will ever do if you want to become good at lean. And I mean now, no excuses. Doesn't matter if you fail miserably, action immediately. That's great advice. Lean Leadership Nation, you've heard it from Paul Akers, somebody who's devoted his company to lean, and he's got other people coming in, other large companies coming in to see how they practice lean and their lean journey. And he has summed it up with the first step is go do, take action, take action now. Paul, what piece of advice would you give to the journeyman professional? Maybe something that someone told you that helped you recently. Wow. Read a book a week. I mean, that's what I do. My dad was an amazing man, a very intelligent man. He was an engineer at General Dynamics, and he read a book a day. I don't know how anyone could do that, but you couldn't converse about him about any subject that he was not fully versed, whether it be chemistry, science, physics, psychology, religion. It was every subject. He had a complete grasp of every great literary mind out there because he was so prolific at reading and he was considerably more intelligent than I was. So I had to set a goal that I felt was reasonable for me. And that goal was a book a week. And I've read a book a week since I graduated from college. And I don't know how people function in the world without getting significant input from other people in a regular and deliberate way. Well, that kind of leads us into the next question. You're the author of your own book. And if they're on your bookshelf, if there would be your favorite book other than your own that you would want to put on your bookshelf, what book or author or mentor would you recommend to our listeners? Well, it's a book that most people would say, you know, good to great Jim Collins. I mean, has any book been written in the last 20 years about business that even comes remotely close to that. I mean, that's, it's all there. Every sentence, every paragraph has meat. I can remember every chapter. I know everything he said. I think I read it eight times. I memorized it from start to finish. I mean, it's, just, it's one of the best books ever written. Now, have you read Great by Choice, one of his other books, the oh, blue book? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's phenomenal. I've read most of, his, most of his books. The other one is, to be honest with you, one that I talk a lot about when I speak in front of people, and it kind of shocks people. If you want to read one of the best books ever written that can really get your head screwed on straight, read The Pur- Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And I always tell people, you only need to read the first sentence on the first paragraph, the first paragraph, the first sentence, and the first line in the whole book. It's not about you. You want to have a great life. You want to have a purpose driven life, you want to have a life of great, intense meaning, it's not about you. Awesome. That's powerful. Thank you for those book recommendations. And I'll make sure to put links to those on the show notes page so people can find those. I know you, the listeners here at Lean Leadership Podcast, are busy individuals and that it's important for you to be able to get great content on the go. So I've partnered with Audible so you can possibly download one of the books mentioned in this podcast episode or your choice of many others for free at llpbook.com. So I know that you would tell me when I ask this question, your first gut will say, Chris, there is no such thing as a magic wand. But if there were, and you could magically fix something with a facility that you're coaching or a team that you're trying to help learn in relation to lean and continuous improvement, what would you typically say poof and fix first with your magic wand? Blow up all the walls in every facility and get the executive staff on the shop floor. Perfect. Can you explain why you would want to do that? Because leadership wants all these lofty accomplishments. They want quality. They want profitability. They, they want organizational health. But they're completely disconnected from the organization. They think they're connected, but they're not. 
And there's no better way to disconnect you from what's really going on in your organization, whether it be a hospital, a manufacturer like me, than to build walls and cubicles and keep everybody isolated so we have a nice, quiet, sterile environment where people can't commune, learn, and collaborate together. It's that simple. I don't have an office. I'm always on the shop floor. I would have it no other way. The shop floor is your office, right? It is the only place I live and thrive all the time. Absolutely. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Paul, uh, as we wrap up here, can you tell people a little bit about FastCap, about what you do and how people can connect with you if they want to learn more about uh, what you do or if they have a question for you? Well, very simply, we invent products for cabinet makers and general contractors and woodworkers. But the cool thing about it is we do that in a lean platform. So probably 80 to 90 percent of all the ideas that we have put on the market, we have 900 products on the market in 40 countries and 2,700 distributors around the world come from regular people who are in their shop with a one man shop or a five man shop, see a problem, find a solution, fix what bugs them. They make a quick video. They send me their idea. I look at it and I say, yeah, I think that's worth marketing or no, and that's not ready for prime time. We take that idea. We treat them with dignity and respect. We pay them a 5% royalty. Even though they have no patents, we could rip off their ideas. And that's what most corporations would do. Hey, we can come up with that own idea. We don't need to pay them. We do just the opposite of what everybody else would expect us to do. Our company continues to flourish and grow exponentially. It's just insane. And that's really what our company is all about. We're not just about making woodworking tools. We're about honoring the creativity of woodworkers around the world. And so, you know, you can find us at fastcap.com or Two Second Lean, and we've got just thousands of videos on there on our products and all the lean resources. Everything's free. You can get the book in Kindle form. You can get it in an uh, iPad version. You can get the audio version. It's in French, Spanish, English, soon to be in Chinese or Mandarin, uh, Portuguese, uh, German, and Russian. I mean, and it's all free. You don't even have to pay for it. I mean, if you want the hardcover copy, you buy 20 or more, you got to pay five bucks, which is our cost. But if all the digital, all the lean stuff, everything's free. No subscription, no email. We don't want anything. Just learn and change the world with us. That's awesome. Uh, Paul, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I've been a big fan of yours personally for a long time. I've uh, really enjoyed the passion and the zeal that you have for continuous improvement. And it shows with the people that are in your videos. It comes out and just your attitude of gratitude related to it. And uh, I've really enjoyed this. So thank you very much personally and Lean Leadership Nation. Uh, I'm glad that I'm able to bring Paul's experience, knowledge, and just his belief system about how this works to you in the podcast. So Paul, a personal thanks. My pleasure, Chris. Anytime. Thanks for listening to the Lean Leadership Podcast with Chris Burnham. Get more info, resources, tools, or connect at Lean Leadership Podcast.